See, she looks just like me, huh? <laughs> well, I'm Jeanette Rankin, and I'd die before I'd come to a thing like this. <laughs> but seriously, folks, I turn back to the beginning of my awkward attempt to write my life story, and I see, when I look at it, I see that my story is our story. The first 10 years of my life were blissful. We lived in a mansion, though we kids didn't know it. It was our house, and we loved it for its hiding places and for the indoor plumbing, even though we were happy to relieve ourselves out of doors when we played with our neighborhood friends. Our neighborhood was our house and land surrounded by teepees. Before Papa built the house, and Papa built most of Missoula, Montana, all that land belonged to the Bitterroot Salish, and they lived around there and were our friends and neighbors. Timmy, one of the boys in my class, used to come over so much, he all but lived with us. He loved to pretend to be Indians. And we, we would set up as Indians and start, have our own teepee out back that we made. <laughs> it, it wasn't a very good teepee. He could start the fire lickety split. He always brought a, a jar of charred cloth, and he was able to rub a stick down in it on a bed of the driest kindling, and poof, a fire. We'd sneak stuff out of the kitchen and make secret stew out there. He was some guy, all right. It was nearly Christmas the year I turned 10 when I overheard Papa talking with some other men about a terrible massacre. I had never heard Papa sound so angry, and I didn't recognize all the words he said, but I knew that something dreadful had happened and somebody had a wounded knee. One night, I woke up to Mama hugging and comforting me. She said, a lot of people are very frightened of people and things they don't understand. But some people have courage in their hearts. Some people are very brave. One of the little boys in your class, you know Timmy in your class, he crossed the plains in a covered wagon with his parents when he was just a tiny baby. Once when they were camped, they heard the Indians coming and made a circle with their wagons. The men all ran to the wagons to get their guns, but this little boy's mother took him in her arms and went out in the direction the Indians were coming. When she met them, she handed them this tiny baby. Now they knew that baby was the most precious thing she had, and if she handed him to them, it showed that she wasn't afraid of them. The Indians took this baby and passed him around from one to the other, the first white baby they'd ever seen. The Indians laughed and talked, and then they handed him back to her and went away. <laughs> Isn't that a nice story? It wasn't long after that when our friends packed everything up, their homes and all their horses and everything, and then moved into a particular place just for them, where no white people were allowed to buy land or hunt or anything. We figured that's where all the buffalo had gone to. Life was different after that. Streets and oil lamps and lots more houses went up all around us. It wasn't the country anymore. The green meadows kept getting smaller and smaller and more and more people moved in. It was soon time for me to go off to college and I was so excited. I was in the very first class at the University of Montana in Missoula and I lived in a dormitory. I studied biology, which was easy, and I loved it. My downfall was, and still is, spelling. For the life of me, I can't spell spell. <laughs> I didn't care about my grades, though. I was glad to be out of the house. After my sister Felina died when she was just 12, Mama gave up, and I was the one who took care of the kids. Mary, Edna, Grace, Harriet, and Wellington. Once I'd graduated high school, I was ready to see the world. I wrote in my di diary, go, go, go. But since he was male, Wellington got to go off to Harvard, while I, the eldest and female, was expected to return home after I graduated to cook, clean, and be mama's nurse. Ugh. No, thank you. 
After I graduated college, Wellington hired a nurse for mama. Thank you, Wellington. I headed off to San Francisco, where I had managed to land a job doing social work in a settlement house. Hot dog, I thought. I've made it. I have a career, and I make my own money, and I will travel the world. Well, the money barely paid my rent. I lived on tin sardines and toast. There was no extra money for celebrations or socializing, not that I was in the mood anyway. My practical social work studies exposed me to conditions so terrible that I cried myself to sleep most nights. I transferred to Seattle to work in an orphan's home, which was even more awful. There wasn't enough money. There were too many children. Only a few could be placed, and half of them returned when people changed their minds. They had suffered so much from poverty, were in such ill health, had such bad habits. Nobody wanted them. They came back and wept in my office. Turnover was overwhelming. My colleagues came and went so quickly that I had no friends there, just acquaintances with whom I'd commiserated briefly before they escaped to greener pastures. Wellington sent me the money to visit him at Harvard, and I welcomed the break only to discover the poverty in Boston even more horrifying than that I'd seen on the West Coast. Well, I returned to Seattle just in time to see women's suffrage pass in the legislature. I'd never thought much about it, but now that I'd seen firsthand the living conditions for widows and their children, women left alone after their husbands worked or drank themselves to death or died of disease or accident or were killed in wars, women who couldn't have a bank account or own property, well, it made sense to me that women should absolutely be counted at the ballot box. It is beautiful and right that a mother should tend her child through typhoid fever. But don't you think it's beautiful and right that she should have a voice in regulating the milk supply from which the typhoid resulted? As I approached my 30th birthday, I threw myself into women's suffrage, scrubbing floors and taking work as a seamstress to pay the rent and cover the other essentials. I knew that the reforms needed to make a difference in the lives of the women and children I had witnessed living in misery and squalor would only happen when women achieved the right to vote. I found my voice working for suffrage. I discovered a moral center that I didn't realize I had. Suffrage doesn't pay, but no job was too commonplace, difficult, or disagreeable because my heart was on fire. I had never imagined myself as a public figure, but there I was, fearlessly giving speeches to thousands of people <laughs> all over the country. I was never afraid, only made bolder by the cheers and encouragement of the crowd. Right. We won the vote in Montana in 1914, and I took a break and sailed to New Zealand, where women had been voting since 1893. The country was young and progressive. I thrived in that society, where there were pensions for the elderly and mothers, workers' compensation and labor arbitration laws, child welfare and labor laws. Rejuvenated and inspired, I returned to the states determined to run for Congress in the 1916 election. <laughs> While I was technically a Republican, well, they were the progressives back then. I insisted that our campaign rhetoric remain nonpartisan. Of the 177,000 votes cast for three candidates in Montana in 1916, 76,932 voted for a woman. And a lot of them were women and Democrats. Before I even knew I'd won, I was besieged by companies wanting me to endorse products and by reporters clamoring to interview me. I thought I would drown in it all, so I re released this simple statement. I'm deeply conscious of the responsibility resting on me. I hope that I may be of some substantial service to the men and women of Montana, my native state, and to the nation. 
I can't say how I'll support every measure in the House. However, I can tell you that women will support their country. And on behalf of the women of America, I'll support measures that benefit workers, women, and children especially. I plan to introduce a Corrupt Practices Act so that great wealth cannot unduly influence the electorate. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I was a tad naive. Anyway, that statement didn't stop the request for interviews and endorsements, but at least I had said something and I could concentrate on getting packed and move to Washington. Wellington came and got me and drove me clear across the country in his brand new 1916 Oldsmobile. I slept the first three days, exhausted from years of unrelenting activism. I had given some 6,000 speeches and traversed the country at least a dozen times. I know. <laughs> Road trips. <laughs> We won the vote in states all over the West, and I was on my way to Washington to sit in Congress. I went to the Congress with violets in my hair. I went in linen and lace. I wore a pin Mama sent with a platinum clasp that her grandmother's grandmother had worn on her wedding day. I went to the Congress in a new automobile with my brother in the driver's seat and all my sisters beside me. I went before suffrage, prohibition, talking pictures or the radio. I went in satin and silk before Margaret Sanger, Rosie the Riveter, or Margaret Chase Smith. I went to the Capitol before Gloria Steinem was a gleam in her daddy's eye. Things weren't simple or easy. The winds of war were blowing hard. Europe was at war and there was a lot of pressure for our country to join England, France and the others to defeat Germany. The suffrage movement was divided as the rest of the country. There was the Carrie Chapman cat faction, the elitist old guard that wanted women to go along with the majority wherever the wind blew them. The other side was the young contingent led by Alice Paul, who was a peacemongering Quaker. God love her. And she was a fierce campaigner for a constitutional amendment. She and Mrs. Cat truly loathed each other, and I spent a lot of time running interference between them. Mrs. Catt pledged the services of the entire suffrage movement to the war effort. She what? cried Alice Paul. She hasn't the authority to pledge our service. And anyway, she's achieved nothing with her piecemeal campaigns. Mrs. Catt complained, Alice Paul spends the money she raises without running it through the treasury. Mrs. Catt is a dictator. Alice Paul is a brat. And back and forth and back and forth and blah, 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 blah. angry hens perpetuating the stereotype we were trying to overcome. Meanwhile, I don't even like you two hearing this. Cover your ears for me. I don't want you to hear this. In 33 states, A man could legally arrange for a doctor to end a woman's pregnancy without her consent. Wow. Yeah. A doctor could capture, confine, sedate, and operate on a woman's body with impunity as long as he was asked to do so by her husband, father, or brother. It was crystal clear to me that the only valid hope for the future lay in true equality. Freedom isn't a sex thing, it's a human thing. You can't have freedom for anybody in a society unless you have it for everybody. As Lincoln said, if you want to keep a man in the gutter, you have to keep standing on him. Neither master nor slave is free. In the early hours of Good Friday morning in April of 1917, the first woman ever elected to the primary legislative body of a free country cast her first vote, a war vote. 
President Woodrow Wilson had called for a vote on the resolution for the United States to go to war with Germany. I couldn't say yay or nay. I broke tradition. I said, I want to stand by my country, but I cannot vote for war. I vote no. I swear to God, there were witnesses. A flock of white doves encircled the Capitol as I voted. The reporters dogged me every move. I was drawn in the media as a weak woman who cast a weak vote, shaming the suffrage movement. According to much of the hate mail I received, I had disgraced the people of Montana by voting like a dove and not like the hawk majority that I supposedly represented. Well, the mail I received about the vote actually supported my position 16 to 1. It was a crazy time. I voted against the War Espionage Act of 1917. Yes, I did. 1917, of course I did. It was a vehicle for baiting aliens and suppressing dissent. The measure sent peace activist Eugene Debs to prison for nearly three years because he made a speech that obstructed recruiting. Hello, First Amendment. He still had about a million votes when he ran for president inside the jail. So, My first term in Congress was deeply marked by the struggle of miners in Montana to win fair pay and safe conditions. When the Granite Mountain mine shaft went up in flames, taking the lives of 167 men, all hell broke loose. The surviving miners walked off the job within a few days. Soon after, Frank Little, half Cherokee, half Quaker, was dragged from his boarding house bed and lynched from a railroad trestle. His crime, helping to organize a union. Around his lifeless neck hung a sign. Others take notice, first and last warning. Furious and terrified, the miners of Montana sent hundreds of telegrams to my office in Washington, begging me to travel to Montana and intervene. As their representative in Congress, it was my duty to demand that the company immediately cease the intimidation and take responsibility for prioritizing war profiteering over the lives of the men who toiled long hours under the brutal conditions to extract the metal from the earth. In 1916, 20% of the world's copper was coming out of the Anaconda mine in Butte. From Anaconda's perspective, the high wartime price of copper used in the manufacture of weapons meant that a labor strike would deeply imperil profits. When I arrived in Butte, a gathering of 5,000 supporters cheered for me at the railway station, and the police quickly pushed me into a cab and sent me to my hotel. They abducted me, not allowing me to address the crowd. However, I would speak to the workers, and I did so on August 18th to a multitude of some 10,000 at Columbia Gardens. It is unpatriotic for labor to strike without just cause, especially in time of war. But it is equally unpatriotic to take advantage of men whose patriotism causes them to continue working under conditions that mean the daily unnecessary risk of their lives. I pledge you my word that I shall always do my utmost to bring out better conditions and do my utmost I did throughout my congressional term, even though I knew the company controlled most of the news outlets in Montana and would work voraciously to ensure but I never returned to Congress. Throughout my term, I also sat on the House Committee for Women's Suffrage. They offered me the chair, but I thought it more prudent to insist that a member of the Democrat majority hold that position. So John Raker of California served as chairman. The proposed 19th Amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote was discussed repeatedly, both with me and after I'd left office. Women's fight for the right to vote was in its final years. The movement had found a renewed energy and enthusiasm during World War I. We were constantly being told that the young men dying overseas were doing so for us, for our freedom. 
but we weren't free. <laughs> Not by a long shot. We asked the questions. Who bears the lion's share of the cost of war? Who faces death in order to give life to men? Who loves and works to rear the sons who are killed in battle? Who plants fields and harvests crops when the able-bodied men are off in battle? Who keeps shops and schools and works in factories while men are in the trenches? Who nurses the wounded, feeds the hungry and the sick, supports the helpless? Who sees their homes destroyed by shell and fire, their little ones slaughtered and their daughters violated? Who are sent adrift, alone, no food, no hope, no shelter for the unborn child? I know a lot of you recognize this letter from Abigail Adams to her husband John, but I think it always bears repeating. I long to hear that you have declared independence. I would desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Well, her husband famously replied that she was so saucy. <laughs> and he could not but laugh at her extraordinary code of laws. After commenting that freed northern slaves, apprentices, and the poor were demanding equal rights, he worried another tribe, women, more numerous and powerful than all the rest, would also be arguing for equality. He reassured her that men would rule fairly and softly because you know we men are the subjects and that men only appeared to be the masters. Women's rights would completely subject us to the despotism of the petticoats. Lucy Stone, God lover, refused to pay her taxes in 1858 and wrote, Enclosed, I return my tax bill without paying it. My reason for doing so is that women suffer taxation and yet have no representation, which is not only unjust to one half of the adult population, but is contrary to our theory of government. For years, some women have been paying their taxes under protest, but still taxes are imposed and representation is not granted. The only course now left us is to refuse to pay the tax. We know well what the immediate result of this refusal must be, but we believe that when the attention of men is called to the wide difference between their theory of government and its practices in this particular, they cannot fail to see the mistake they now make by imposing taxes on women while they refuse them the right of suffrage. And that the sense of justice, which is in all good men, will lead them to correct it then we shall cheerfully pay our taxes, and not till then. Do you know when the first woman suffrage amendment was proposed in Congress? Anybody? 1878. Introduced on the floor by Senator Aaron Sargent of California, bless his radical heart. That's right, 42 years it took to pass and be ratified, and it happened because we were persistent. We would win the right to vote or die trying. President Wilson seemed to think we would get tired or bored or something and just go home. <laughs> he and his ilk didn't have a clue. They didn't realize that the basic right to vote was and remains a matter of life and death, and we were prepared to fight to the death, some of us literally. We were the mothers, the sisters, the aunts, the grandmothers, the teachers and the friends of the boys at the front who knew something of the democracy for which they fought. Those courageous lads, it's hard for me to say again, those courageous lads who paid with their lives testified to their sincerity when they sent home their ballots and voted two for one, in favor of women's suffrage at home. World War I, boys in the trenches, two for one voted for us to have women's suffrage. I asked my colleagues in the House, how shall we answer the challenge, gentlemen? How shall we explain to them the meaning of democracy if the same Congress that voted to make the world safe 
for democracy, refuses to give this small measure of democracy to the women of the country. On November 14th of 1917, 33 women were arrested for engaging in civil disobedience at the White House. Before them, some 500 had been arrested, and the numbers strained the capacity of the D.C. jail. So these women were sent to a hellhole in Virginia. Meanwhile, I was in Congress. I woke every day in my warm, comfortable bed, took a bath and washed my hair. I sat out on the porch, sipped my coffee, and had my egg. I walked to the Capitol, walked the beautiful tree-lined streets to my office where my assistant had more coffee waiting for me and newspaper clippings and telegrams. Not a morning passed that first term in Congress that there weren't a handful of marriage proposals waiting for me. My secretary, Bell, and I spent most mornings giggling over those telegrams and dipping slivers of cinnamon toast in our coffee. One morning, though, Bell came knocking on my door and got me out of bed early. It was September, still plenty warm, so I ran out the door without a jacket, while Bell all but dragged me to the office. The silent sentinels, suffragist protesters, had been pulled off the street into paddy wagons with no warning and no way to reach their families or let anyone know what was happening to them. Overnight, they had been dragged, beaten, stripped, and shackled, standing with their arms over their heads. They had begun a hunger fast which infuriated their captors. I had visited the workhouse earlier in the summer with the chairman of the House Committee on Women's Suffrage, and we had observed the gruel crawling with worms that was supposed to pass as food. I had seen the black eyes and bare feet of well-to-do, respected Washington wives and mothers, mothers of boys who were dying in Europe for our freedom. Galvanized by the spotlight provided by enraged citizens learning about the brutal treatment of incarcerated suffragists, systematically, one step at a time, one day at a time, we ultimately prevailed when the 19th Amendment was passed by Congress on June 4, 1919, and ratified on August 18, 1920. Here's a fun fact. It took 14 months for the 19th Amendment to be ratified. We needed three-fourths or, three or 36 states, and we only had 35 when Tennessee voted on ratification. Harry T. Byrne was only 22, the youngest representative ever elected to the General Assembly when he broke with his colleagues and voted to ratify. Turns out he had gotten a letter from his mother. <laughs> His clerk had delivered it to him right there on the floor. She asked him to be a good boy and vote for the amendment. <laughs> Here's to mama's boys. The Democrat machine did exactly what they said they would do, and I was gerrymandered right out of my district. I tried for the Senate, but didn't make it out of the primary by a tiny margin. So a bunch of us put together an independent campaign that lost Hope Springs Eternal. Yeah, well. Now it was the Roaring Twenties, and here we are, 100 years later, in the Roaring Twenties again. And I can't help but notice how similar so many things are. I learned quickly in the suffrage years that we must get the people who don't come to political meetings who don't commiserate at the union halls. It never did any good for all the suffragists to sit around talking to each other. We must be stubborn, stubborn and ornery. If there's a mountain in the way, we must climb it to get to the people. It's a matter of life and death. The jazz age hadn't stopped babies from dying of cold and hunger. Soldiers died for lack of woolen shirts, even though their mothers and sisters, their sweethearts, wives and daughters now had the vote. I admit here and now, as I have many times, that the biggest disappointment of my life is seeing women either vote as their husbands do or not vote at all. The work of peace is women's work. The work of justice for women and children is women's work. We have male allies. Yes, thank you, bless you, thank you all. But without women driving, healthy communities find themselves taking a backseat to concerns about politics. What is a healthy community? 
Well, I maintain it's a community where babies are born to healthy mothers who've been raised with the best possible health care. Healthy communities have universal education, health, and economic security. Healthy children go to school with full bellies and open minds. In 1920, once the 19th Amendment was ratified law throughout the land, we women had our most difficult challenges still ahead. We couldn't sit back and celebrate while 12 million American women suffered for better conditions in fields and factories where they very often worked side by side with their children who never knew what a childhood was. Fathers, too, worked beside their sons in mines and mills. Yes, folks, when the jazz age was in full swing, only a tiny minority of Americans actually lived it. Workers, including women and children, lived the same hard scrabble life they always had. We won't condemn the parents of the nearly 600,000 kids who worked on family farms. That's a culture that probably goes back to a time thousands of years before any cornerstone was laid anywhere. So let's leave the family farms alone and look elsewhere. In 1920, more than 70,000 American children worked seven days a week for fractions of pennies in fields and farms and as, as lumber and fishermen. Another 70,000 worked in textile and clothing. Another 60,000 worked in manufacturing tobacco and chemicals. 20,000 more were consider considered manufacturing apprentices. 17,000 workers worked, uh, children worked in iron and steel. 10,000 worked on furniture and 10,000 more worked in the food industry. Nope, not done yet. 20,000 worked in transportation, and 60,000 more worked as domestic helpers and personal attendants. That's about 430,000 kids working, not going to school, not playing stickball in vacant lots, but working for wages to help support their families. That wasn't my childhood, and I bet it wasn't yours. But in 1920, in the United States of America, during the roaring, wonderful jazz age 20s, it was legal. We didn't have any meaningful child labor laws in this country until 1938. Does a free country put its children to work in fields and factories and mines and mills to breathe dust and chemicals when their little lungs have yet to even be fully grown? What kinds of parents allow their children to be subjected to such unthinkable lives? Poor parents. And by poor, I certainly don't mean less than good. I mean parents who were themselves born into poverty and see nothing but poverty ahead of them. The few extra pennies their children bring into the home make the difference between having bread on the table and going without. In 1920, more than 60% of Americans lived in poverty. This is before the Depression. Generally, farmers, black American immigrants and workers in traditional industries did not enjoy Roaring Twenties prosperity. Despite massive building projects during the Roaring Twenties, construction workers missed out on the boom, and their wages increased by only 4% during the entirety of the 1920s. Life was particularly hard for black Americans in the southern states. The majority were poor sharecroppers on farms owned by white landlords. When the price of crops fell, or the bull weevil devastated cotton crops, the workers were either sacked or did not receive their share of the harvest they were entitled to. Three quarters of a million people lost their jobs during the 1920s. As a result, thousands of black Americans moved to northern cities such as New York, Detroit, and Chicago to look for work, and life was not much better there. They were given the worst paying jobs and usually lived in squalor. Some companies had an all white policy other firms only used them during strikes to break the power of trade unions. Most immigrants had not been educated and were willing to work in any job for very low pay. This led to wages dropping off for other employees. Because of this, immigrants endured more and more prejudice from white workers. When mechanization redu reduced the need for workers, immigrants were among the first to be sacked. Although some women were better off and 25% more women were employed by 1929, most women were poorly paid, especially in the textile industry. Most were still employed in roles such as cleaners and waitresses, and that hasn't changed. 
They were legally and systematically paid less than men doing the same job. Does this sound familiar to you? Are the conditions I speak of 100 years ago really any fundamentally different in your area? The area of handheld computers, globalization? Things progressed and they didn't. The more things changed in the 20th century, the more they stayed the same. I know that I'm not alone when I admit that I have a hard time enjoying our way of life when it means that children and their parents go to bed hungry every single night in this country. In this country, the land of the free, the home of the brave, waves of grain from sea to shining sea, and babies starve to death a stone's throw from Fifth Avenue still today. Oh, yes, thank you. There's some questions from the audience. Yes, let's get this inevitable one out of the way. Miss Rankin, were you married? Did you have children? <laughs> yes. But I was what you'd call today polyamorous. I was married to the peace movement, the women's movement, and the worldwide justice movement. I had millions of children, those who went to bed hungry and woke up afraid. Next! Although the suffrage movement sought equality for women, it did not necessarily promote equality between the races. You were the exception, and you espoused this philosophy by rooming with an Afro-American suffragist when you traveled by boat to Europe in 1919, and you marched in the back with Afro-American and Jewish suffragists at peace and suffrage parades. Yes, I'm a wonderful person. <laughs> Seriously, though, Mary Terrell can't be reduced to an Afro-American suffragist. She had a master's degree from Oberlin. Mary, Mary taught Latin, Greek, and spoke five other languages. But don't take my word for it. Read her autobiography, A Colored Woman in a White World. She was one of the most interesting, erudite, and fun people I ever knew. Of course I wanted to bunk with her on the long trip across the Atlantic Ocean. As for me walking in the back in parades, that's a romantic idea someone made up and tucked into an article about me. I wish I'd thought of it, but truthfully, I didn't. And I wasn't out front fighting racism. I was too politically savvy to step out on that limb. It's one of the biggest shames of my life that the congressional record has my words forever enshrined. In response to the very racist Mississippi Senator John Sharp, who said, we pass your amendment, and then Negro women could vote. I responded, but couldn't you keep them from voting the same way you keep the Negro men from voting? The history of women's suffrage in America is not nice or neat, because the impact of white supremacy is broad, and human nature is messy. Furthermore, a nation built on stolen land from Native Americans and stolen labor from enslaved Africans is flawed from the start. We must constantly acknowledge this truth. I could have spoken up for African Americans back during the suffrage era, but I didn't. I'm no saint. In fact, when this subject comes up, I want to crawl under the bed and hide. One more question. You seem to equate American domestic and foreign policy with that of the Japanese and Nazis in World War II. How can you possibly compare what we've done to those atrocities committed by those enemies? Notwithstanding the sins of omission since the end of that war, the 86,000 civilians incinerated in the firebombing of Tokyo, the 650,000 mothers, children, grandmothers, and grandfathers pulverized in the bombing of Germany, the internment of Japanese Americans, and the institutionalized robbery of, all they, robbery of all they had in the world, the systematic ghettoization and subjugation of enslaved Africans and their descendants, and the persecution of the Irish and Chinese and Italians and African Americans and the Mexicans who built this country, and Truman's massacres at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Why don't you research the atrocities committed by the American army on the American Indians? Millions killed, raped, starved, slaughtered. Now you tell me, isn't it more than comparable? How will this cycle of violence be broken? When 
Will we finally acknowledge the beam in our own eye and our own complicity in causing the situation? And when will we draw the line and stop letting people make money from the business of war? It always comes down to money. I had a good long talk about this with Mr. Roosevelt way back when he was a senator. Just what is it that you want, Ms. Rankin? He asked me. What do I want? What does any compassionate thinking citizen want? I want education, health, and economic security for every American and everyone in the world. I want a world governed by only one law, one, law, one hard and fast rule. We know what that is, right? One rule, the golden rule. I want peace on earth. <sighs> Don't you?